Welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, another episode of Pound Pound Box Report, Report episode 306. Um, if you're wondering, for those who are checking us out live, if you're wondering, Pound for Pound Box Report on a Friday, yep, uh, due to circumstances in the busy schedule, busy work schedule and whatnot outside this uh, podcast, um, our original format, original day of doing it on Monday had to be postponed. And so, yeah, you hear us now on a Friday night. Uh, joining me this week, um, Gail from Community Digital News, Daniel from the Inscriber. What's going on, lady and gent? Hey, good evening. Better late than never. It's the freshest take possible on this weekend. Yeah, pound for pound boxing report on a, on Friday the 13th. Ooh, oh, spooky. that's right. Oh, my God. <laughs> You're doing that to my attention. Oh, my God. Uh, so, yeah, for, for, you listen, for those who are listening, want some uh, boxing, want their boxing fix on a Friday night? Uh, 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 fortunate for you, here we are. Um, for those who are new to the show, Pound Pound Box Report Live YouTube show podcast, as well as blog discussing all things boxing. The motto is when boxing is good, we will talk about it. When it's bad, we will talk about it. Bottom line is if it concerns the sweet science, we will talk about it. Uh, for those who want to um, check out any and all, check out where to uh, find us all over social media, where to find us all over uh, a particular uh, platforms that carry podcasts and distribute podcasts, the blog page for the Time being is the best place to go to uh, p4pboxreport.wordpress.com. You check the top right of the page to find all that information, where to find us all over, uh, where to find the Facebook page, where to find the Twitter page, where you can check out the show on platforms like iTunes and Spotify, Google Podcasts, uh, uh, Mixcloud, Spreaker. We're just about everywhere right now uh, when it comes to podcasts. You can also, on the blog page, check out my, check out where you can uh, uh, donate. Let donation be the best nation. We got both a cash me and PayPal donation links on the blog page. And if you're checking us out live on Twitter, on YouTube, excuse me, um, on the Twitter page, or even if you're checking us out via podcast formats like iTunes and all that, I provide all the information there. And on the podcast, on the um, blog page specifically, um, if you're interested in getting in yourself into shape, um, taking your fitness up to the next level as we get ready to hit the holiday season. Um, Thanksgiving is what two weeks away, uh, technically less than two weeks away. Um, check out my um, online coaching page. I am an online coach for Beachbody.com. I um, currently got the Let's Build Together November uh, group challenge based around the workout program on Beachbody on Demand. Um, ten rounds. Ten rounds is a boxing based for boxing based uh, program that combines uh, boxing cardio moves as well as uh, weightlifting. Um, it's really is is I think it's right up folks alley for those who like boxing or for those even who do not like boxing. If you're looking for something um, challenging, but not too strenuous where you think you cannot do it 10 rounds. Yes, you can um, just hit me, hit, hit me up on the blog page or you can just hit me up on pound for pound box report, Twitter page P at P four P box report, or even my personal page, brother JR at brother JR seven, six. So if you're interested in that, or if you want to get into, uh, um, some free workouts because Beach Body on Beach Body um, on demand on Beach Body on demand uh, we have two week two week free trial workouts throughout the year. So if you want to get two weeks for free workouts of around this time of the year, uh, uh, there you go. And I see uh, I think Gail is gone for a second. She's coming. Daniel's gone for a second. He's coming right back. Let's get things going. Normally, what we do is we um, recap fights from the previous weekend news. And then preview fights for the upcoming weekend, but I'm going to switch the format here because um, of the news that broke up earlier this week, uh, yesterday, a couple of days ago, I believe it was. Um, we've been asking for months, really throughout the year, um, when is Canelo Alvarez going to fight? Canelo Alvarez, of course, um, if you want a middleweight champion, um, beat Kovalev in his last outing to win a belt at 175. He also has a quote unquote belt at 168 pounds. Um, again, the question was, what it, when will we see Canelo next in the ring? He's been um, hinting uh, that he wanted to fight, have a fight this year. Well, I'll go to you, Gail. News broke, I want to say a couple of days ago. No, it may have been yesterday. It may have been yesterday. My apologies that a deal has been struck for Canelo to fight. Uh, Callum Smith, who has a WBA title at 168 pounds. Um, the fight is going to happen in December. I'm not sure if it's the 19th uh, or the 26th, the day after Christmas. Um, 
but yeah, Canelo, he's returning to the ring and he's going to return to the ring this year, apparently. Uh, give some backstory here in, in terms of the details on how this fight got made and is there a finalized date on when we'll see Alvarez and Smith? Well, let's first of all make it clear there is nothing confirmed. <laughs> there are simply sources, reports, and so on. From some people in a position to know, including of all things, Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. The deal is, as we all know, that Canelo and DAZN, his broadcast partner, and Golden Boy Promotions, his longtime promoter, have come to a very messy business divorce. The argument apparently is really with Golden Boy. Golden Boy is the one that had the deal to deliver certain fights to the zone. Alvarez doesn't have a direct deal with the zone. His direct deal is with Golden Boy, who made certain assertions with the zone that they didn't own up to telling Canelo. It's been a tense relationship for a long time. It came to civil lawsuits filed by the Alvarez side of things. The problem is with the pandemic, boxing, you know, the pandemic is getting a say in boxing and it's even getting a say when boxing is in the courts. Most courts in California where this suit was filed have been closed for months, for months and months. They're just now opening with a priority on criminal prosecution. Getting a civil lawsuit through court right now, um, unless it's a emergency with people's safety is at stake is not going to happen. So if Canelo and his team really wanted to stick it to these guys and pursue an actual civil proceeding in court, they'd be waiting months, if not years, simply because of the pandemic timing. They're not open, not opening courtrooms and they're not bringing in jurors. They're not certainly not bringing in jurors for a civil suit. So I'm sure somebody in the legal system and somebody in the very smart law firm that no doubt Alvarez could afford to hire said to him, listen, you know, if you want to prove a point and you really want to stick it to them and get to court, you're going to wait for years. Time is not going to wait for him. He's 30 years old. Does he really want to sit out for several years? Oh, like Andre Ward did or Oh, like Mikey Garcia did, you know, it just didn't in the end go well for them. And I'm sure he realized that's just not going to happen. So what happens at that point is you have options for mediation, various types, and you can bring in a retired judge uh, or some other kind of neutral party to, you know, play the role of a judge and talk it through, come to an agreement. And they did. As it turned out, that's exactly what they did. It was the smart thing to do. DAZN essentially let him walk away, and apparently Golden Boy essentially let him walk away. It, it's a good move for DAZN in the long run. They way overbought on Canelo. The deal they made with him was just a crazy huge amount of money, and I think they realized in retrospect that it wasn't, really the best deal. I'm sure they had some buyer's remorse. So the truth is, with Canelo walking away, that's a whole lot of money that's back in their budget. They, in a lot of ways, really benefit from this. The one that got hurt was Golden Boy. They lose their big cash cow. Now, it's possible that if they turn their attention and really focus on developing the next generation of fighters, they'll be fine. So here we are with Canelo able now to make deals with various players. And we started hearing rumors. He was going to fight Caleb Plant over on the PBC side of the house. Wow. That, that was a pretty exciting little piece of gossip. And then we hear the last few days, guess who he's close to agreeing to a fight with? WBA World Super Middleweight Champion, Callum Smith. One of the guys we've been originally talking about all this time, trying to get a fight on DAZN with. And guess what broadcast partner he's talking to? Yes, DAZN. So clearly there's 
no hard feelings between Alvarez's side and DAZN. Now that Golden Boy's out of the picture, he and DAZN seem to be able to do business just fine. So various sources, including uh, the BBC, have said that Team Canelo and Team Smith, brokered by Matchroom Boxing, um, have been discussing getting this fight done. Here's the problem. As you so pointed out, Michael, it's November 13th. It's November 13th. You know, a December 19th fight, you know, do the math. That is weeks away. This would be a major, major fight in any year because you've got Canelo in the ring, let alone in a pandemic year, year where we haven't seen him at all. I find it very hard to believe they could get this together for the 19th. They're going to need to find a venue. They're going to need to get the protocol done. Are both fighters ready to get in the ring? There are a lot of moving parts and questions to be answered. However, having said all that, you know, Canelo can call the shots. If he's ready to go and it's not a matter of selling tickets, which certainly helps, and they've got a ready-made partner to go into zone and a date, and he thinks he's physically ready, it's possible. I just think December 19th is a stretch. Personally, I do not see this happening on December 26th. There are just a lot of distractions at that time of year to put a fight on. However, if I wanna argue the other side of things, you know, do they do it in the UK? That's Boxing Day. It's a holiday. It's possible. And if Canelo is just hell-bent on seeing 2020 on his resume, he doesn't have a whole lot of other choices. December 5th is completely taken up with the Spence Garcia fight. Um, I'm, I'm hard-pressed to recall who's booked on the 12th. Um, but then, you know, the, then, then that means that the last date for you real, really for 2020 is the 19th, unless he goes to a weeknight, which would be sort of interesting. If he does it in early January, I just, I can't see that being anything but a good idea other than this, I thought in Canelo's head that I've got to have a fight in 2020. So nothing's in stone. Nothing's officially announced. There's been a lot of discussion. I mean, we were going to have a Caleb Plant fight up to the minute that we were suddenly going to have a Callum Smith fight. So take this, boxing fans, you know, for what it's worth. Not confirmed, not agreed to. Don't spend your money just yet. In, in terms of a fight happening in the UK, that's... I highly doubt that's going to happen at this point because, um, and, and shout out to uh, EJ Boxing Live, uh, the homie over there, uh, Unrivaled hints that this is the last time he was on the show, uh, I want to say a couple of weeks ago. Um, but EJ told me this specifically that, that England right now is in the midst of being um, shut down. I think, Daniel, you mentioned this as well. Uh, England is right now in the midst of being uh, uh, shut down right. uh, because point. of COVID. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, and who's to say that we're not going to have a lot of areas tightening up considerably by then? I mean, we are looking at some outrageous COVID numbers right now in the United States, too. So, yeah, particularly over the last couple of weeks. Where in the world is this supposed to happen? I, I think the window is closing realistically very, very fast. I, I, you know, I think... I get that Canelo is itching to go. I have a hard time seeing this happen this year. I'll go to you, Daniel. Um, the probability in your mind that this fight is going to happen. A, well, first of all, let me let me let me let me correct that. A, do you think that there will be a fight between Canelo and and Callum Smith? B, the probability that it will happen um, this year. C, uh, your reaction, if this is all true, your reaction to uh, Smith 
being the guy that Canelo is going to fight uh, presumably next? I'll try to go in reverse order. Uh, it's not surprising. That's It's one of the fights that even with Golden Boy, they were leaning towards. So that's not a real surprise in the end that Callum would get into it. Plant to me was always going to be a long shot in that aspect because if you start asking the questions about Caleb Plant, the questions start coming up about Maul. And that that's going to involve yourself deeper into the PBC vortex and such. Now, as far as the fight happening this year, I don't think there's any way it's going to happen this year. Now, like you mentioned, the UK is going to go shut down for a month and more than likely it'll be longer. Uh, almost the entire country here with the amount of cases that you're seeing going up is going to be more than likely, you've seen Chicago already do an advisory. You've seen the state of Utah do a little bit of advisory. Over here in, New York, in the New York tri-state area, Mayor de Blasio pretty much said schools more than likely are going to be shut down on Monday. So there's really no major metropolitan area that you're going to have available for this type of fight. Because... I mentioned it, we mentioned it a thousand times when it comes to Canelo Alvarez. He's one of the people that you need fans. You need fans to be sitting in those seats when it comes to a Canelo kind of fight. He's one of those guys that you can't just throw into an empty arena fight. And right now, there's almost no state that can safely do it and allow fans in. The overall situation, I it's kind of expected. We we all knew that Golden Boy and Canelo were never never seen eye to eye for a good two years now, and it's one of the toughest things. You see it all the time in boxing. You see a good fighter, a top level fighter, suddenly get clashing with the promoter, and ultimately there is some type of breakup. You. It's rare nowadays for you to see a promoter and a fighter stick all the way to the end. There's always some type of change, unfortunately. And now I think Canelo, because you've seen the Was Beckless rumors, now you're seeing Canelo more than likely as a free agent learning that maybe promoting, negotiating without a mediator is going to be a little bit harder than when you had somebody do it on your behalf. Because with the fight with Callum Smith, right now Callum doesn't have much of a name here in the U.S., so you would have, logically, you would have to have to go to the U.K. But like we mentioned, U.K. does not look to be pretty good right now as far as having venues with fans. If you fight Killer Plant, you... The logical choices to fight him would be either Las Vegas, L.A., or his hometown uh -huh. in Tennessee. Mm. So, mm. It's interesting because uh, Caleb Plant, actually, um, he went on a Twitter, not a Twitter or Instagram rant either. I think it was on his, no, it was on his IG stores or something. Uh, talking about how he was open and ready for the fight, but uh, I guess he wasn't the final choice. So I just wanted to begin the show with that kind of breaking news, if you will. Um, will the fight happen between Canelo and Callum? Who knows? But uh, that is the word out there. It would be a little bit irresponsible on, on our behalf to not at least address uh, uh, the issue. Let's get going here and get it back to our regular, our regular groove and start recapping these fights. I'm going to going back to you, Daniel, to uh, begin things. Um, let's start with Devin Haney, who is the WBC uh, a lightweight champion. Um, fought over this weekend, fought this weekend um, against uh, Yorkis Gamboa. Gamboa, of course, his last time out, he he uh, lost to Tank Davis. I, I looked at it when we talked about it last week as a bit of a comparison fight. And the question I had on the table was, 
uh, could Haney be more impressive um, if he would have win against Gamboa than uh, Javante was uh, when he fought uh, Gamboa. Uh, Haney won easy, won by unanimous decision, um, almost a shutout on all, all, all the judges' scorecards. Um, I will re, I will ask the question. I will update the question for this episode that I uh, had last week, Daniel. Um, did, in your opinion, did Haney or was Haney more impressive in his win against Gamboa um, than the aforementioned uh, Tank Davis? So we have lost Daniel, and I will step in. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, I was paying attention and checking out some other things. I didn't know he was going, but yeah. Uh, Daniel. Uh, Technical issues. Hey, technology, we love it. We hate it at the same time. So all of us doing previews of this fight said very clearly because of the performances in particular of Teofimo Lopez and Gervonta Davis, Haney needed a statement. And this was also prior to thinking that we'd see Ryan Garcia in a couple of weeks, which we won't, but Assuming that Garcia would be going for a big statement win, of which he has seemed very capable lately, Haney needed to keep up with the rest of the guys. And he didn't. He didn't. He got a very solid win, very competent win. He's skilled. He could box all day. He can... Uh, avoid uh, getting into deep waters easily. I mean, he handled Gamboa. Gamboa was never a threat to him at all. Was it a fun fight to watch? For certain boxing nerds, sure. You know, he, he did a good job. Was it exciting? No, it was not. There were a lot of boo birds. There was a lot of the B word, uh, boring on boxing Twitter and social media. It just didn't help Haney's case for being an attractive opponent. I heard an interview middle of the week with Gervonta Davis's trainer, Calvin Ford. And they asked Ford, you know, who do you want to fight next? And he made it very clear that one the one fight he'd love right now, wait for it, is Ryan Garcia. Why? Because Ryan brings fans to the table. Ryan has a following. Devin Haney does not. And Ford was very blunt. Haney doesn't, Haney doesn't bring anything to the table. Even though you think, looking at that performance against what Davis was able to do, that Davis might want to get in there and take him out, feel like he'd have the upper hand. But from the business side of things, which I know a lot of fans, like once again, here we get into the business side of boxing again. But if you want to make a pay-per-view fight and get maximum eyeballs on there, it helps if both fighters bring a following. And Davis certainly has one, but he doesn't want to carry all the freight by himself. He wants someone to help him. Ford didn't even think that Lopez at this point has enough of a following, certainly not compared to Garcia. Here's going to be Haney's problem. He's perfectly competent. He's, you know, he's very skilled, but, you know, he's in danger of becoming this generation's Arizlandi Lara. <laughs> he just, he really is. I hope a lot of this is because Haney is still very young. Um, I don't think he might actually be the youngest of the so-called four horsemen, Davis. He's certainly younger than Davis, who's the oldest of the four. Um, I think Lopez is next. And I think Garcia actually is older than Haney. So maybe that's it. I hope that's true. I think he risks getting left behind in this interesting four-man de facto tournament. Here's, um, I'll answer the question I asked earlier and I asked uh, to everybody else here. I uh, hope Daniel, we can get him back. Um, was Haney impressive, quote unquote? 
he won. He won by comfortable margin. He dominated throughout. However, he he didn't leave a great impression. Um, just checking out the commentary, uh, once I got home and was able to catch the fight after I got home from work, a lot of people called him, was the, the word boring um, was used a lot uh, to describe uh, his performance in particular. Um, if you want to think, if you think you, you're a star, uh, if you think you're that it fighter, if you, in the days after, was claiming that you are the man at 135, um, sorry, kid, not off of that performance. You have to do more. Um, if you're going to box like that, you have to box in a real dynamic, skillful way that leaves, that opens eyes much in the way that, <coughs> excuse me, much in the way that you saw from Pernell Whitaker back in the 90s, someone like that. Um, or you have to get some knockouts. Um, to me, he has the potential to be dynamic. He just doesn't put it all together in the fight. He is young. I think he's 22. He'll be 23 uh, either later this month or early next month or early, either later this month or early December. But there's something missing, uh, Gail. I watch him and I say to myself, he's good, but is he elite? Did he Has he shown what we saw from Teofimo against Loma? No. No, clearly not. I mean, he does, you know, it's a funny thing to say. He he won all but one round on all three scorecards. Um, and I mean, he lost one round. He he had yeah. shutouts on two, I believe, and there was a mercy round given to Gamboa by somebody on the third, as I recall. So, you know, you can't dominate scorecards much more than that. It, it's hard to criticize that. And yet boxing is entertainment. Sports is entertainment as well as achievement. And without the entertainment value and bringing in the platform from the business side that allows them to make money doing this as a profession, you just don't have a lot to work with. That's, that's the problem. I think Haney is one of those guys also who rises to the level of his opposition frequently. He also has this sort of interesting performance roller coaster. You know, he'll have a couple of fights like this where he's very competent, dominates, and is just dead boring. And then suddenly he has a couple of fights where he blows guys out. Well, I hope that means that after this last fight, whatever he does next, he you know, scores a really flashy win, but that's what he needed to do this time. And he didn't do it. I'm crossing my fingers. It's due to the opponent. It's due to his age, his youth. Um, we'll see what happened. You know, also Haney's always been trained by his dad. Maybe he needs to think about a little change up in the training department to make him more of an offensive fighter. I'm not going to put it on the. I'm not going to say it's because of Gamboa because yeah. Gamboa looked like the shell of himself. Yeah. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I think ultimately that's 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 on him. Um, there were punches there. There were opportunities there. It wasn't like Gamboa was moving a whole lot in the ring in there. Um, he wasn't elusive at all. He was there to be hit all night long. He just again, he just didn't bring it all together. Where he goes from here is to be determined. But. Uh, moving forward, he has to. He has to, if he wants to make a statement, if he wants to leave an impression on folks' minds, um, if he wants to be considered that it guy, that future pound for pound guy, uh, you have to have more. Um, you have to bring more to the table than that. Uh, quick word, Gail, on Philip Hergovich. I believe he fought on the undercard against Rydell Booker. Won by fifth round stoppage. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to see the fight, but uh, reading stuff on Twitter uh, uh, while at the job. Um, a lot of people were like, eh, uh, just pretty meh in terms of his overall performance. Uh, your thoughts? Uh, he did fine. Again, he didn't have a lot to work with. Booker was essentially a human punching bag. That was that was about it. He was there to be hit. He was there with his guard up and just kind of there. 
and it could have been stopped even earlier than it was when the fight was stopped uh, by the referee after Hergovic was landing blows on uh, Booker. He walked over, Booker goes over to his corner. Hergovic, Hergovic follows him over there and clearly can be heard, you know, say, you know, uh, greeting him. Thank you. This and that. And then he says, you're too old. <laughs> and he's right. Booker had no business being in there. I mean, this was a make work fight. I think er Hergovic is very talented. I'd like to see him get a bit more of a challenge. And I would really, really like to see an all Croatian grudge match blowout because Alan Bebic, who is a rising star in the matchroom stable, wants a piece of Hergovic bad. And Babic, who calls himself Babic the Savage, is a shit talker of um, immense skill. And I think it'd be a great fun uh, lead up to this fight. And they're, they're at about the right level. So why not? Why not? And if it ends up being, you know, a series, you get a kind of a Croatian trilogy going on. You know, I've seen a lot worse. You know, there are a lot of just big guys because they don't have to make weight that they'll just put in the ring as an opponent for these young heavyweights. And that proves nothing at all. Um, let's move on to uh, a heavyweight action um, that that um, Hergovic, that Haney card with Hergovic on the undercard, that, Her that Haney fight, excuse me, with Hergovic on the undercard, that was on the zone. Um, on Fox, uh, Fox PBC, you had uh, Luis Ortiz. I hadn't seen him in the, in, in the ring almost a year since his rematch. Uh, stoppage loss at the hands of Deontay Wilder. Uh, made his return uh, at the Microsoft Theater um, in L.A., uh, fought a guy by the name of Flores, stopped him in 56 seconds, um, 46 seconds, excuse me, uh, by way of a shot. I say a shot to the body because I looked at the replay and I didn't see much land. Um, is this another case? Is this another case of a phantom punch knocking someone out in, in 2020? Because I watched it, I was like, okay, <laughs> the shot that quote unquote landed, it wasn't that hard. And yet Flores went down in all agony like he's been shot. Look, what was that? The shot not heard around the world. Well, first of all, Michael, I got to ask you, don't you think Luis Ortiz looks really great for a 62-year-old guy in the ring? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I had, you know, the Cuban birth certificates. I had to go there. You know, we don't really know how old Ortiz is. I mean, we've all made jokes over the years. That was just plain strange to the point now that the California State Athletic Commission has opened an investigation into what happened and they have withheld Flora's purse because it just seems so blatant. You know, whether Flores realized he was completely overmatched seeing Ortiz come at him and decided, oh, damn, I got to get out of here. It's hard to say what happened. It it certainly didn't look right. And the blow seemed, you know, too inconsequential. The follow-up, you know, he really, Ortiz kind of just slammed him with a, a bicep, which was, you know, as a follow-up kind of almost falling on him. It was just really odd. But it didn't seem enough, even if it was awkward, to keep Flores down in, as you said, that kind of agony. That was a guy looking for a way to get out of there and leave with his paycheck. You know, and the California State Athletic Commission, Athletic Commission, to their credit, didn't take kindly to it. And, you know, it it's certainly not a bad signal to the rest of the sport that at least for California – sanctioned fights, uh, they really aren't going to tolerate that kind of stuff. And they end up making an example out of him. I believe his purse was 80 grand. Well, that that's a lot of money to leave off the table. <laughs> it's certainly a message if that's what happens. Uh, I'm sure they'll give a ruling at their next meeting. I don't know if they're scheduled to have a meeting in, in December or not. We'll see what happens, uh, what kind of ruling we get. Very disappointing 
the truth is most people were over watching the Haney fight anyway. So a lot of, and that was a pretty easy one to catch on YouTube. Uh, and if you've got time, look it up. I mean, as you pointed out, Michael, it's 46 seconds of your life. You know, watch it and decide for yourself what happened there. It'd be better just to watch the uh, one, two second highlight than watch the overall 46 seconds because it wasn't, you know, didn't much <laughs> happen prior to that. And then just that shot, and he just, that that quote unquote punch, and he just went down in, in a heap. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and frequently, yeah. I mean, it does happen that you are watching a fight and you think, well, where did that, where did that punch come from? And it's some little inside check hook, right? You know, we've all seen someone go down without seeing a punch like that, but Trying to connect the dots here. Just, and there were no dots to connect. There were, <laughs> well said, exactly. <laughs> um, let's move on to uh, one final flight here. I know you didn't see the flight. I'm going to uh, break it down myself since I was able to saw, see it live. And um, did a recap of Three Kings Boxing. Uh, for those who may not know, I am a writer for threekingsboxing.com. Uh, shout out to the, to the folks behind Three Kings Boxing. Uh, the head of operation, the HNIC, if you will, 2K, um, head of media relations, um, Bo, who's also a frequent guest of the show and also fellow writers, um, uh, Bakari, um, head lead writer, myself and uh, Jarrell Bikul, um senior writers, as well as the uh, uh, editor uh, over at 3Kings, dot, dot, 3kingsboxing.com, Red. Um, What's going on? Um, shout out to um, Intangible Boxing um, News in the chat. Uh, thanks for uh, checking us out. This final fight I'm going to talk about here before we move on to uh, news and whatnot. Uh, fight took place in Japan. We previewed it last week. Um, Unrivaled Boxing News, Unboxing Talk News, uh, gave an excellent preview of this fight as um, Junto Nakatani uh, fought a fighter by the name of, fought a fighter by the name of, uh, give me a quick second about a fighter fighter by the name of um, Jamil Magrano, uh, over in Japan, Tokyo to be specific. Uh, they fought for the vacant WBO flyweight tap title, a uh, title that was vacated by Kosei Tanaka, who we're going to talk about later on in the show. Uh, Tanaka moving up to 115 pounds. Um, Nakatani won by eighth round, uh, stoppage, uh, X going in, this was basically a 50 50 matchup uh, between Nakatani and uh, Magramo. But from early on, really the first round, uh, Nakatani he sees the initiative. Uh, he's tall, he's a tall southpaw, he's a tall uh, southpaw flyweight, five seven and a half, five eight. Uh, he controlled the action from jump, he did any, anything he wanted to basically. Uh, when he wanted to uh, box from the outside, he did that. Even on the inside, he had the better advantage as well. Very, very cute in terms of how he applies his punches, in terms of how he goes about the trade. Um, he can do a little bit of everything. He can throw shots from the outside, but he can also land short inside shots, both in combination. Very good uh, uh, arsenal to hit and body. He basically just used – he won this fight to the point that, to me, he didn't even need to go into second, third, fourth gear. That's how much control he had of it. Um, hurt, uh, hurt Magramo in rounds seven, eight, uh, with body punches before finishing him off in round eight. Um, it depends on your perspective in terms of how your your view of Nakatani. You can either say he dominated because he dominated to such extent. You can say that oh, he's the next coming, or Magramo is not the fighter that people. Uh, uh, thought he was heading in. I take a little bit of both. Uh, Magrano, he was good record. Uh his only loss was a close uh was was a close uh decision loss to uh flyweight Mohammed Wasim Wasim a former world uh, uh flyweight uh world title challenger but Nakatani he has the look of someone who may be of high uh, may be of quality who may be of the goods um I wouldn't put him on the level of Julio Cesar Martinez yet, Gail, but or even or even um, uh, uh, um, the the South African. Um, his name was escapes me right now, but I'll remember it as we'll talk. Even the uh, um, 
South African Muthalane. But I think he has potential to hold on to the title for a while. Assuming it all depends on if he fights. It all depends on an upcoming fight that's probably going to happen against Angel Acosta. As you know, Angel Acosta is a former 108-pound champion, a big explosive puncher. Acosta is ranked number two by the WBO at 112 pounds. Um, they, it looks like they will probably fight at some point in 2021. And on paper, that looks also to be pretty much an even fight. The skill, the length, the height, the skill, and the slickness of Nakatami versus the power, the explosiveness of Acosta is a fight I would really look forward to in 2021. But yeah, uh, Nakatani won. He won in easy fashion. He looked good doing it. And unlike Haney, in my opinion, he performed in a way that left impressions on the minds of folks, particularly folks who follow the lower weight fighters. Uh, he's a, in short, he's a guy to keep an eye on. He's a guy to keep an eye on as you we head into the lower weight divisions in 2020. You just can't overstate the need to be entertaining, to be entertaining. You don't have to score wicked, crazy knockouts, but you do need to engage in, you know, you, you do need to show some, effective aggression and not strictly uh you know a defensive technical fight yes they you can win all day that way but you know you do need to entertain so guys like this hey i i would love to see an acosta fight you know and acosta brings the experience to the table that you know sometimes can make up in the technical arenas and especially in the lower weight classes man those guys get it on you know, there are really no technical fighters at, you know, super flyweight and below. They bang. Indeed, indeed. Uh, let's move on to some news here. Um, going In my discussion about uh, the Nakatani, in my breakdown of the Nakata, of Nakatani's win over McGrammo, I mentioned that this fight was for uh, the flyweight belt that was vacated by uh, Kosei Tanaka. Well, Going back to Kanaka, Tanaka for this, Gail, as uh, after last week we talked about, I mentioned that I was hearing that uh, uh, the Tanaka, that Tanaka's proposed fight against um, uh, Kazuta Ioka uh, was not going to happen, that he was going to take part in an exhibition. Well, I have to report him now that I was, uh, my, what I was told turns out to be not true. In short, I was wrong. As uh, earlier this week, uh, Ioka uh, had a held a virtual online presser in which he announced he is in, indeed going to fight Tanaka. The fight is going to happen uh, in December um, in Tokyo, I believe. Um, if you are a fan of the lower white fighters, or if you consider yourself a real a hardcore fan, uh, Gail, for me, this is a fight you can't miss. This is a fight you have to watch. Uh, whether if it means if it means you have to get up early in the morning to watch it live on some stream um, to catch the fight overseas or on tape delay uh, on some YouTube channel or, or daily motion channel or whatnot. Uh, regardless, what we have here are two highly uh, accomplished guys, two fighters with great resumes, particularly. Uh, um, particularly Tanaka, given the fact that he's had, what, 15 fights, and yet he's a three-division, three-time world champion. Um, Ioka himself is a four-time world champion. Uh, both rose up from, from 105. They're meeting now at 115 pounds. Both, uh, I mentioned Ioka. He had a press conference, I want to I want to say, on Tuesday. Tanaka held a press conference on Wednesday. Both came off uber confident. Uh, Ioka basically, he just, it came off as dismissive through translation, trans Japanese, Japanese translation, that he's just taking this fight because he's a, because uh, Tanaka is a, a mandatory. Um, Tanaka, in turn, basically said, I'm going to, my, my goal is to knock him out. And he wants to be, uh, paraphrasing here, uh, he wants to be the future of Japanese boxing. So they're both talking big, um, they're both self assured. On paper, that looks to be a hell of a fight. Uh, I can't wait. I love a good bit of healthy trash talk. 
a lot of a lot of little smacking down by these guys. They should be confident going into a fight with each other. They should be confident about what they're able to do. Uh, I'm going to prevail. No, I'm going to prevail. Yeah, and they both have the goods. You know, these guys will bring it. They'll be very aggressive in just the speed. You know, that is part of what I love and one of the greatest things about Japanese boxing. They they train for speed and they train every other aspect of their fight game to support the speed. It's not just flailing, it's speed with power. You know, when you look at somebody at the pinnacle of that, Anoya in a way, you know, who punches from the feet up with speed and power, you, know, you see what these guys are capable of when they put it all together. Is really, I, I'm trying to think, Michael, I'd be hard pressed to name a Japanese fight at, at any significant professional level that wasn't wildly entertaining. It just, there isn't such a thing. And it's, a, it's unfortunate that because of the time zones, American fans are just not exposed to a lot of Asian fighting, Asian boxing, and they're missing out. So Michael is right. Do yourself a favor and make sure at least after the fact, you get onto YouTube and find this fight. Indeed, um, they're fighting for Ioka's title, WBO title at 115 pounds. For those who have not seen Ioka, um, former champion at 100, 105, 108, 112, and now 115. Uh, he's more of okay, how, how can I put this in this fight? He's more of, uh, I would say, the boxer, quote unquote, if you will. In this fight, uh, he's not, in my opinion. Even though, even though Tanaka is moving up, I think he's the bigger puncher overall, right? Uh, where um, I, Ioka, because he's the older fighter, um, because he's more experienced, he's the more smooth, uh, 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 calculated fighter. Um, fans of this of the smaller weights, they may remember him um, from his fights against uh, McWilliams Arroyo. I want to say on the final, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah, the final super flyweight uh, a series card back in yes. 2018. He beat Arroyo yes. by a uh, unanimous decision, scored a knockdown in that fight. Um, where, well, as Tanaka, I've had a healthy debate uh, between uh, myself and my brethren, um, head over head over at 3kingsboxing.com, 2K, uh, regarding who's the best fighter in Japan um Tanaka or or uh, the monster in Nile in a way I tend to lean towards in a way where uh well where 2k he tends to lean towards uh, uh Tanaka Tanaka um, really really talented all around fighter very explosive uh that eye catching explosiveness where it's not just speed it's just power um uh, when I first saw him at 105 pounds and and early in his days at 108, I was somewhat skeptical skeptical uh, because I saw him hurt um, when he won the title and his couple couple title defenses here and there. Um, and also, uh, I just thought something was missing. But over the last, I want to say, two, two and a half years, he has improved significantly, um, skilled, can hit. Can hit hard and he likes to fight one of his one of his deficiencies sometimes he stands in the pocket and fights too much um when he fought uh, uh taguchi uh former uh 108 pound champion royalty taguchi he showed off his body punching prowess there as well even though the fight with the decision to Aguchi, he was so beat up at the end of the fight he needed help going back to the corner that spoke to the savagery in which uh um uh tanaka uh, with at his body, uh, I just I'm just tremendously impressed by him now. Um, I thought at the time he left the division, he was the best in the world. 112 pounds of fight between him, and 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 Julio Cesar Martinez would have been a fantastic fight at 112 pounds. But he's decided to move up to 115. Um, I read the presser. I reported about it for Three Kings Box, and I just give a little insight here. While his goal is to knock out Ioka, he has a long-term goal, Gail, 
of becoming, I mentioned he wants to become the future Japanese boxing. Uh, he looks at in a way as kind of the model of what to do. He wants to fight in the States. He's trained in the States. He trained in the United States uh, last year um, in, in Nevada at Bones Adam Gym in Nevada. Um, he has visions, uh, you'll like this girl. He has visions of fighting both uh, Roman Gonzalez and Juan Francisco Estrada should he uh, defeat uh, Ioka. So not only is he very, very talented fighter, he has aspirations of taking his show on the road and following the path set the path set by um, Inoue and becoming a, a real international attraction. I, I love a guy that's that ambitious. And you know that division is just on fire. There are so many good fights for him. And right now, that division is very visible in the North American audience, you know, led by Estrada and Gonzalez. And it's a perfect time for him to capitalize on this. And, you know, depending on what we see this weekend uh, in the undercard fight with uh, the rematch between Franco and Maloney, you know, Franco is... Yeah, raising his hand. I, I don't think he's quite in the upper tier, but he's a solid guy if you want an opponent, and he's got a belt. Indeed, indeed. So I want to. Uh, so again, if you have, um, if you find a way to watch that fight live or on tape delay, uh, uh, do yourself a favor and, and please uh, check that check out that fight because um, again, um, nothing's guaranteed in this sport, but. Uh, this fight certainly has all the recipes to be one of the fights uh, of the year. And again, it's taking place uh, the last day of the year to cap off 2020, December 20, December 31st over, over in Tokyo. Um, going and, on to some... And let's just point out to the fans that might not know, New Year's Eve boxing is a tradition in Japan. It's a big, big event to get on the New Year's Eve show. So... That speaks very well for this fight just because of the date chosen. This is Japan's version of a Cinco de Mayo weekend fight. Indeed, indeed. Um, over the, you mentioned um, while we were uh, analyzing Canelo's move and the possible fight against Callum Smith, uh, we, we were mentioning how England um, is right now in lockdown because of rising number of COVID-19. And we also talked about the rising numbers of COVID-19 uh, here in the States. Well, uh, the pandemic that has just um, been so much uh, the news, not only in boxing, but in uh, society across the world, it strikes this ugly head again. Um, over the past a couple, three weeks, there's been a rash uh, of, of cases of fighters uh, testing positive for COVID-19. Well, um, it strikes this ugly head again um, as it has an impact, on, a direct impact on what was the supposed to be the upcoming fight between Ryan Garcia and Luke Campbell for WBC um, interim title. I believe it was at 135 pounds. As uh, You can give some backstory on this, Gail, as apparently um, Campbell has uh, unfortunately tested positive for covid yeah, unfortunately, Golden Boy Promotions announced the fight has been postponed because Campbell himself popped a positive COVID test. It's just hideously disappointing. Um, however, the word is, should there be the Canelo fight, you know, December 19th, that provides a soft landing for the fight, which is why there's already been some discussion about that um, going on and you know that that's a that's a pretty good save but boy we've had a lot of fights fall out unfortunately um you know due to these tests and uh, michael i think you know boxing has really done a fabulous job overall no criticism of the way all of these various bubbles and controls have been handled I'm considering especially what a astonishing rise in cases we've had recently they've done a great job you know most fights the vast majority of fights you know have gone on successfully um you know we got the davis santa cruz fight off with almost ten thousand fans in the house 
I think it's going to be, I think that window is really closing. You know, it's almost like you see that, that tunnel closing up behind these guys as they're running to keep ahead of it. And I, I think we're going to be hard pressed to get a lot of these fights done in the really dark months of winter before we get a handle on this before spring weather, you know, naturally sort of tamps it down. And, you know, hopefully before a vaccine shows up in the spring, even if we've got something late in the year, you know, it's going to take some time to get it out there and get it to take hold. So truly we should cherish every single fight card that manages to come off right now and enjoy it while we can. And another bit of late breaking news uh, surrounding the uh, uh, virus as the upcoming uh, fight between uh, WBC Bantamweight champion um, Nordino Bali and Nonito Donaire that was supposed to happen uh, December 12th. That has been postponed as Obali uh, has tested positive uh, for COVID-19. Um He's going to be replaced. I'm, I'm just reading the story. Excuse me, right quick. I just saw it on my feed. Um, he's going to be replaced by a former uh, IBF uh, uh, bantamweight champion, Emmanuel uh, Rodriguez. Um, this is according to uh, um, MTK Global um, CEO Bob Yellen. So again, uh, we just mentioned Garcia, and once again, um, COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen. It is a is a nasty little bugger. Um, affecting boxers out all, all over the world. Will the sport have to be put on lockdown again, like it was uh, for much of the spring and in early summer, because of uh, these rash uh, number of fighters now uh, coming down with the uh, uh, with the virus, Gail? You know, I, I, I don't think it would be a lockdown due to the various fighters you know, popping positive, I, I think it's going to be more of a issue of COVID infiltrating our society right now in numbers we hadn't, we haven't ever seen, frankly, in the United States, we were way over 150,000 positive tests just today. And I just think that working inside such a difficult outer environment for these guys to have to control is just going to become harder and harder and harder. I do think it's possible there may be some regional stop downs where, where, um, you know, the the rash of COVID cases in a given nation or area pops up. You know, as, as Daniel is the one to point out, you know, the UK is really struggling right now. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what we're going to see in the United States. I would not be shocked to see some controls, perhaps regional controls, if nothing else. Maybe there's some other nations where it's not as much of a risk. Certainly we're seeing countries where the virus is much more under control. If you, you could stage a fight easily in Australia, in New Zealand, in certain parts of Southeast Asia, in there's not that much of a problem. You're going to have to deal with issues of quarantines if that's your only option to stage fights. That will be the problem. And the problem also for North American and European fans, British fans, is that a lot of the safest places to hold fights are in those pesky, inconvenient time zones around the other side of the world. So remains to be seen. I, I just, I see, I see... I see some tightening of the schedule and some of the top names thinking maybe I need to wait this out if it's just a matter of a few months until we get into the spring. It's not that far away. I, I do hope we'll get through this year's schedule at least, you know, right through that Tanaka Ioka fight on the New Year's Eve, maybe at least that far, but I I would not make any solid solid plans if it was me past that. Um, uh, before 
before we move on to uh, uh, um, uh, preview some flights here, because I'm going to run some, I'm going to run it a little, I'm going to run the show a little short because I know um, you're tight with time. Uh, I'm going to leave the floor open to you. Um, any other news uh, uh, developments that you want to uh, speak on before we start previewing flights here and uh, um, end of the show, end of this particular episode? I think we've hit the major news of the week, thank, uh, thankfully. Um, so let's get to this weekend's fights. And there are two main fight cards to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one in Vegas and also one in London. Uh, let's focus on the Vegas one first. As on ESPN, um, that's a treat. Uh, uh, Terrence Bud Crawford uh, going to be fighting Kel Brook. Crawford defending his WBO title. Before we get into that fight specifically, uh, there's been a lot of talk. Um, I wrote about this for Three Kings Boxing um, that there seem to be rumblings of, of Bud. Uh, and promoter Bob Arum being on a bit of shaky ground. Um, Arum, um, in a surprisingly admission on 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 uh, barbershop conversations, said that yes, yes. Uh, Crawford could very well uh, leave top rank. There's been rumors, there's been rumors that Crawford is maybe interested, has an eye on leaving top rank. Uh, 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 Mute your mic, Gail. I'm hearing a tiny little bit of echo. Let me see if that works. Okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, and, and have your mic muted as well, Daniel. Um, get you back into this conversation. Um, been a little bit of rumblings here and there. I've been hearing that 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 Crawford may be upset. Crawford, as well as his manager, the trainer, trainer uh, Bo Mac McIntyre, may be upset because so far as a welterweight. Uh, Bud has been unable uh, to land a big fight, notably with the fighters across the street over at PBC, be it Spence, be it Thurman, be it Garcia, be it Porter. Uh, I mentioned how Aram uh, said on Barbershop Conversations that 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 he could he could that Crawford could possibly leave. Uh, uh, top rank to move on. Crawford was asked about that on on the last stand with Brian Custer, his podcast. On the one hand, Crawford said that that you know Aram is my promoter and he's the, he's my guy right now. But Custer, to his credit, he followed up and asked if he were to leave. If he were to leave, why? What would the reason be? And Crawford just basically said money. Money and the flight, the fact that I couldn't get the big fights, and he made sure to mention that his contract with Top Rank runs out soon. I believe the contract, his contract, ends in October twenty twenty one. Given what I've just said here, Gail, and you can follow up, Daniel. Yes, let's talk about the fight shortly. But there's much been as much talk about the relationship uh, between Top Rank. And Bud being on a little bit of a shaky ground. Your thoughts on all this, and how much of this is a, is a distraction um, leading into this fight with Brooke? I don't. I don't think it's a huge distraction. This is not um, a massive challenge for Bud. Let's face it, and we'll talk about that in the preview. And I think this is just a naturally frustrated guy. You know, it is not really top ranks fault. Crawford's one of these guys that's had difficulty, like a lot of other fighters, getting opponents to face them because it doesn't come with a massive payday against the risk. So the difference, especially in the later years, fighting someone like Floyd Mayweather, for example, people are willing to risk fighting Floyd because the painting was so massive. You know, you get somebody like, this is a complaint that got leveraged with Golovkin for years and Crawford for years. And to a certain point with a lot of really great dangerous fighters who don't fit that very narrow superstar, huge money category because the risk is so great and the payday isn't big enough for the risk. So Bud's frustrated by the situation. 
created mainly because he's really good at what he does. And most of his best opponents are hidden, you know, on another side of the promotional firewall. You know, how aggressive Bob's supposed to be, you know, it's tough. The best fights Bob can make means he puts up, you know, some of his other money-making fighters as sacrifices to Bud. Pacquiao, you know, in his current status, still makes far more money for top rank than Crawford does. Do you want to feed Pacquiao to Crawford? Yeah, not unless you absolutely can't help it, unless it's Pacquiao's very last fight or maybe Bud's last fight. We, I mean, we all know who we want Bud to face, Errol Spence. However, Bud himself has said that up before Spence had his horrible vehicle accident, you know, he was all over that. He wanted Errol, no question about it. He does not want Errol right now until he proves himself completely healed from the car accident. He is very eager to see the Garcia fight. He said, you know, if I took on a damaged version of Errol Spence, I'd get nothing but heat for it. It would prove nothing to anybody. You know, fans would complain. Oh, well, you fought him after he'd, you know, been hurt and was never the same after his car accident, you know, so he can't win. So I think he's just, pardon me. I think he's just naturally frustrated and I don't think we should be reading much into this. I really don't. I'll go to you, Daniel, uh, uh, prior to uh, giving a full uh, breakdown uh, of our keys to this, uh, this fight between Crawford and, and Brooke, uh, your reaction to all the hubbub we've been hearing um, in the days leading up to this, they're going to fight tomorrow in this fight. Again, we're recording this live Friday the 13th. Uh, the fight is going to happen the next day on the 14th. Your 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 reaction to all the rumblings and rumors about uh, dissension in the ranks between um, Terrence Crawford and Top Rank? Let's face it. We expected this because of the division that Bud is in, unfortunately. When when Bud signed a contract with Top Rank, I think almost all of us saw this impasse coming because, unfortunately, a lot of the key players, like Gail mentioned, that are in the welterweight, including Pacquiao himself, are with Heyman, are on the PBC side. And we know now that... It's been long established that Bob Arum and Al Heyman will not do business with each other unless it is absolutely necessary. And right now, there's probably no need for to put a PBC fighter in with Bud. As much as we don't like it, as much as we wish it would be different, that's unfortunately the situation. And I can understand the frustration that Bud's team and Bomac would have with it, but they put themselves into this situation. That's one of the bad things about it. I understand loyalty. I understand that you they decide to make money with the person that essentially made you, but at the same time, you always have to look at the landscape. And especially now when it comes into the situation where, okay, if you want to get peak Errol Spence, we don't even know if Errol Spence will ever get into the peak that he was before because of the accident. So we have to look into that with the Garcia fight. And everybody else that's around the division where Sean Porter, Boots Ennis, like even a young kid like Boots Ennis, go, would fall into that line. The only fighter that I could see that could actually be more feasible to make that will become a player in the what the vision is Virgil Ortiz, but I don't think Virgil's ready for Bud yet. But it's an easier fight to make than what's been presented. So I'm not, I'm not surprised, unfortunately, that this is happening. Now, as far as the fight itself, if this fight was four years ago, I would be very excited because at that point, even at that point, Kelberg was still. In good, 
at least post primary at welterweight or junior middleweight. Basically, if you gave me Kell Brook before the Triple G fight, I would be good. I would be completely, completely good in having this fight into it. But it's the biggest name you can get. It's still a name that in many ways is credible. And it's also a fighter that, for all I said, is still a very skilled fighter. So it'll be interesting for Bud, especially now with the time off that he's had, to see if there's any ring rust falling into it, if there's any of those frustrations going to lead into the ring instead of out of it, and if Bud is going to be helping to trying to make a statement in this fight to pretty much just say to the other PBC guys, if you want a slice of of the featherweight pie, if you want to make sure you can say the dominant weight, the dominant welterweight in the world, you have to come see me. I agree. If this fight was uh, took place prior prior to um, Kel signing the fight Triple G, I would make this a 50-50 fight. I really couldn't predict the winner. Problem is, he lost to Triple G, got his face broke, at least one side, Gail. Came back, fight Spence, got the hit, got the other side of his face broke, and he hasn't looked good since. He hadn't fought at 147 pounds since. Uh, he made the weight today, and he looked ripped to ripped to the bone. But looks can be deceiving. On the one hand, on the outside, your body can look one way, but on the inside, you can feel like crap. You don't know what I'm talking about. Ask most of your competitive bodybuilders. Um, they look like hulks on the outside on the stage, but they really their insides are just bleh. They're just a wreck. Um, so you just don't know what what we're going to get from from Kel. Um, because of that, I cannot make him the favorite in any kind of a way. Um, I cannot see an ups. Anything's possible, and and if he's if he has anything left, Kel, <coughs> he could do something. The problem is, I just don't think that at this age and the fact that he's coming down now and he hasn't looked good in four years, four years since twenty sixteen, prior to the Triple G fight. Yeah, uh, uh, on the surface, Gail, I, I just don't see it. Your thoughts? Yeah, you know, Brook should get enormous respect. He takes every tough fight in front of him. He's frequently too brave for his own good. He fights guys bigger than him. He fights guys younger, more powerful. Yeah, he's had his face broken up pretty bad, but Kel Brook has a lot of nerve. He deserves our respect. He gives absolutely every ounce of effort. You know, he never bows out. He's pretty much got to be dragged out of the ring. And, you know, here he is again. You know, nobody else would fight Bud. And he said, hey, I'll, I'll call on me. I'm up for it. I'll do it. I'm, I'm good for it. And he does always give a decent accounting for himself. However, <laughs> the odds makers agree with you and then some, Michael. He is currently a seven to one underdog. Seven to one underdog. Does he have a chance? Sure, he's got a chance. He does have the tools. It, it's possible. Is it likely? Oh, hell no. <laughs> and I say that being a Kelbrook fan, um, I was ringside for his fight with Sean Porter. He was super impressive. He was not ex he was not all that well known in the United States at that point. And most of us on Media Row felt he'd done enough to win the fight and thought, sure, he'd get shafted by the judges in Southern California. When we heard and the new and he burst into tears and fell to his knees, that was a absolutely the finest performance of his career. Really, really good performance. He's been chasing that ever since, unfortunately. Um, I hope I hope he makes himself proud of his effort against Bud. I hope to God Bud takes him out with a body shot and doesn't bust up his face again <laughs> and that he can walk away with his head held high. 
with a good entertaining fight, but I just can't see except in an upset of the year, him beating Bud Crawford. Yeah, but at the very least, he's getting a $2 million payday. So, hey, yeah. that's, that's yeah. the kind of fight you end your career on. You really do. And good for him. Uh, one other fight on this, uh, on the undercard. Well, one other fight on this uh, ESPN televised uh, 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 card. That is a rematch between uh, Joshua Franco and um, um, Andrew Maloney. They fought earlier this summer for a belt at 115 pounds. Uh, whoever wants this fight, uh, you can take it. I'm going to leave it up to one of whoever wants it. Um, Franco won by decision. Uh, this is a lot of damage to Maloney. Um, cut. I think he had damage to his. He had damage to uh, his nose. Uh, another part of his uh, face. Upset stomach to the throughout through the during the fight uh, to the point that Maloney thought he was going to get sick and throw up during the fight. But but yeah. He, he he's decided he wants some more. Um, they're gonna run it back. Um, can Maloney turn it, turn it around this time? Um, will the damage and the physical injuries he suffered through that first fight will it creep into his head mentally? Um, is Franco just too good and too tough for this guy? Uh, your thoughts? And for anybody who wants to respond, Franco is extremely tough, and Franco got toughened up. In that trilogy, he fought with Oscar Negrete. I mean, there was not a minute's pause in any of those three fights between those two. So Franco is, at this point, fearless. I mean, he's walked through fire now against Negrete three times. That was, that was one of those situations where you've got two guys perfectly paired, a styles make fights sort of situation that they're absolutely, you know, the right balance and level against each other three wildly entertaining fights that were in no way championship or high level fights at all. They were just simply great fights. And Franco came away from those fights thinking, you know, nothing can be as hard as this. They, it gave him terrific confidence. It, it just toughened him up like crazy. And he's already won a fight like that similar against Maloney and Looking at him at the weigh-in and hearing from him in the fight week lead-up, he's just got that extra little bit of confidence now because he's beat him once. I think he's got Maloney's number. You know, Maloney is here to uh, revenge him, and you know he wants to get back his good name and get his title back. But I think he's going in there at a disadvantage to Franco. Uh, I just don't see. I don't see Franco uh, letting go of that belt. And you know, you you have really got to walk through fire when you fight Franco. So I, I just can't see Maloney doing it. And you know, when a guy says he's, I, I understand that sometimes you get in the ring and you're just, you know, for whatever reason, man, it's just bad timing. You don't feel great. It's not your day. You know, everybody's had a bad workout from time to time. That just, hey, that's just not the best day, but you know, he was starting to edge toward the costume was too heavy kind of excuses. I mean, the last I heard, he blamed his upset stomach on he had drank too much Gatorade. So eh, that's not a good look there, Mr. Maloney. I mean, I think he'll go in and do his best. And, you know, it's possible it might upstage the main event, depending on what happens. So it's a good little fight. I, I like the fact they decided to go right back for the rematch again. After Franco went through those three wars with Negrete, you know, he's ready to just go for it. Good for them. Indeed. So uh, at the very least, you should have a, I think that fight, you're right, yeah, that fight could steal the night, uh, could be the best fight on the televised card. Again, both of those fights. Um, Franco Maloney, too, as well as Crawford Brook is going to air uh, November 14th on ESPN. So again, uh, kudos to ESPN. I think, the, you know, the fact that they didn't, um, put in a ways bout on either ESPN or ESPN too. Um, they're going to put Crawford Brook on ESPN. Um, that make up for what they didn't do with it in a way, but it is what it is. Besides Crawford, high, he's a high profile fighter. A lot of people, well, a lot of people have him top two, three um, amongst the uh, 
in terms of pound for pound rankings in the sport. Let's move on to. I mentioned this fight in this card in Vegas. The other card is in London, um, on, on the zone. Kind of a treat here. Uh, whoever wants to pick this card up, uh, a tr women's world title boxing triple header. I'm headlined by Katie Taylor. Last time we saw her was in her rematch win against Pearson. Uh, she's fighting Miriam Gonzalez uh, for all the belts at 135 pounds on the undercard of that. Harper, Terry Harper, who we lost, saw uh, get a questionable draw, in my opinion, a questionable draw against Natasha Jonas. I thought Jonas Edera etched her out. That's my opinion. Uh, she's uh, Harper is going to make a mandatory defense by the name of by uh, against a woman by the name against uh Tanders or uh, Tanders, excuse me for pronouncing the name wrong. Third fight, honestly, I don't know much about these two, two ladies in this third fight or George and Lena uh Guanani fighting Rachel Ball for a vacant title at 118 pounds. Uh, for any who wants to uh pick up this uh, uh triple header again, first time I remember being a all women's world title triple header. Uh, please do. It's a it's a rare one. It's a very very rare event where you're gonna have this. But the Taylor fight's probably gonna be. We know there's gonna be a couple of eyeballs that are probably in Las Vegas right now. I miss Michaela Mayer keeping an eye on this fight when it comes to Katie Taylor because she I said she just won a title and she's certainly has the size where she can move up to one thirty five pretty easily. And that's going to be interesting because Taylor Prout really did a good job when it came to the fire pursuit in the rematch. You have to get the momentum going, especially when you had the situation where the brackets fight, unfortunately, is now, is now at the window. So you lose that money fight, but you can make yourself the person that could make the money in this fight. And right now with everybody else, pretty quiet, like we mentioned. Clarissa Shields not we probably not gonna fight this year. I don't know what's gonna happen with McCask uh, the fight with McCasco because I think from what I understand, Breckis may want a rematch, but that is ultimately gonna be telling how we're gonna see this. But Taylor's probably gonna put in the show. I don't know much unfortunately about the other two fights because Taylor's the one that caught my eye when it came to this card. Because I I just looked at it today. It was the first card all female. Dart fights in a while that I know recent in recent memory. Uh, quick word on this uh, card, Gail, if you have any. Yeah, these these are primarily showcase fights for the three ladies. I mean, Taylor is coming off that fight with Delphine Pursun, which you know wasn't thankfully for her as tough as the first one. She she got a lot better in her rematch. Um, but good for her. You know, that was only three months ago. And she's right back in the ring. She wants to stay busy. She wanted to defend. She got a date. Good for her. Um, I agree with you, Michael. I felt Terry Harper lost that fight to Natasha Jonas. Narrowly, admittedly. You know, one of those didn't agree with the outcome but not a robbery kind of fights. I think this is somewhat of a confidence builder fight for Terry Harper. Um Eddie Hearn is very, very high on Terry Harper. Very. She, he thinks she's a superstar in the making. So I think this is a bit of a gift for her. The opponent is from Norway. And yes, uh, Cecilia Brockes is from Norway. But that is where the similarities end. <laughs> she has not faced um, any significant opposition. She has fought quite a bit early in her career in Spain and uh, all European fights. Um, she did win a interim WBC super featherweight title, you know, WBC, they like to hand stuff out. So that made it somewhat legit. Um, I think we're going to see that she's got one of those paper records for the most part. Uh, Rachel Bell is an emerging, or Rachel Paul, pardon me, is a, kind of an emerging star on the women's scene. And she's getting that third fight, that third um, undercard fight. The opponent is a fill-in, taking the fight on short notice. I think 10 days notice. Um, the original opponent failed to, uh, if, um, 
the original opponent was uh, out uh, due to a shoulder injury. And now the current uh, fill-in opponent failed to make weight. So the title is only um, up for Rachel Ball, um, which is too bad. She's uh, fighting at super bantam weight. Uh, she's tall for the weight division. Um, again, one of these British, young British talented women fighters that seem to be rising up. She's got a lot of personality. And again, you know, a little bit in the Terry Harper vein, Eddie Hearn's very high on her. She's, she's still fairly unproven. I mean, um, a male fighter in this position would certainly be considered barely a prospect, but you know, in the women's half of boxing, um, you know, the, the talent pool is just not as deep, but she's got a lot of potential. So it'll be interesting to see. And then there are three um, undercard fights with uh, regional fighters. So fun fun card um, and love seeing the ladies carry this fight available uh, on the zone. Um, getting ready to close things down here. But before we give a final wrap on this episode, uh, you were away for a, a, a good minute, Daniel. Um, Want to bring you back into this discussion. Um, earlier we talked about uh, the fight between Kazuta Ioka and Kosei Tanaka, and how, in, in our opinion, um, if you get a chance to watch it, uh, do yourself a, a favor and, and, and check that fight out. I'm going to give you a moment right here, right now, uh, uh, to uh, opine about that fight. Oh, I got scared for a little bit because I, I, I also heard those exhibition rumors that you mentioned, Mike. And But luckily, Kazuto put that to rest. And this is going to be an interesting, a very interesting fight because they're putting themselves in that weight class, 115, where a lot of the players are now starting to line up themselves against each other. And in many ways, this could be one of those, even though Casato is not really that old, it's a fight that could be seen as more of a changing of the guard within like the greater Japanese tier because in a way in many ways has positioned himself now to be more of an international star than just strictly a Japanese star. And especially like I said with, with that performance he had against Maloney. So he positioned himself more international. So this fight with Kazuto and Tanaka, it's more of a fight where you can see that this is going to be for the person that's going to hold the main status in Japan for a good bit and it's going to be a very interesting fight because Kazuto remember we, he briefly retired and then came back he looked really good at 115 we know what power Tanaka has the tenacity that Tanaka has in the ring and you can tell like they, they did have trash talk respectful trash talk but it was good amount of trash talk you know both of these guys know what's on the line they know their fight could be part of the main key fight that Japanese audience could could see for a very long bit, depending on how the world is shaping up. So I'm really glad that this is going forward. And we know that other people are keeping an eye on it, including uh, Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Strada, or possibly even Mr. Cuadras. And I think we're going to shut things on, on that final note. Um, I want to thank Intangible Boxing News for checking us out on the show on, in terms of the live YouTube stream. Um, if you like what you've heard, for those who are listening now or those who will listen to us later, check the show out later on YouTube. Please make sure to hit that like button. Also hit that subscribe button. If you're checking us out on um, iTunes, Spotify, other podcast uh, platforms, please make sure to subscribe, particularly on iTunes and Spotify. And I would also love to hear some comments and in terms of how you feel about the show, um, what we can do to make the show better, what you like the show, and hell, even what you do not like about the show. A uh, five-star review will get uh, read on a future episode. Um, I'm going to go around the panel here. Uh, we begin the show with Ladies First. We're going to end the show with Ladies First. Um, yeah, for Community Digital News, for those who want to talk to Sweet Science, for those who want to talk uh, uh, media because you do teach media on the side, or for those who want to... Uh, uh, here for those who want to hear some uh, fun recaps about Dancing with the Stars, or in case you want to give your schedule on your next appearance on TMZ, 
uh, let folks know where they can find you. Well, check your listings on Tuesday. I'll be back on TMZ Live talking, uh, you know, uh, some of my own trash inspired by Bud Crawford and Kel Brook next week on TMZ. In the meantime, uh, you can reach me and read my regular column uh, for Communities Digital News, which is COM, C-O-M-M, Digi, D-I-G-I, news, com, digi-news.com. And yes, I swim in the cesspool that is boxing Twitter. So chat with me anytime. Now, I'll go to you, Daniel, for those who want to talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk NBA, particularly as it pertains to Miami Heat. Now, I believe the NBA is going to get kicked back up, I believe, next month. Um, oh, for those who want to... Um, Check you out, um, roasting um, nonsense on Twitter. Uh, let the folks know where they can find you. Uh, yes, uh, folks, you can find me on Twitter, Ruckus99, R A W K U Z 99. Definitely, let's like, say, catch me on there. Hopefully, I get some things that I put in the back burner for a long time back up at the end of the year because this has been a very, very, very interesting year. But definitely catch on there. And yes. It's going to be December 22nd. I think the draft is going to be next week, followed by what's looking to be one of the craziest trade seasons as we're going to have in a long time. And I hear him. Who is it? Russell Westbrook, James Harden, possibly on the chopping block, and other fire, not just um, trading seasons, but free agents as well. Um, Hearing the Lakers are interested in Serge Ibaka, so yeah, NBA is it's 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 crazy right now. For those who want to talk boxing, music, fitness with me, you know what it is on Twitter, brother Jr. at brother Jr. Seven Six. As I said to begin the show, if you want to check out all information, where to find Pound for Pound Box Report all over social media and on podcast platforms, you know what it is for the time being. The blog page is the place to go to p four p box report dot wordpress dot com. Um, on the next episode, I'm not going to lie to you. Weekend of the 21st, it's light. Um, only significant bout is um, Connor Ben. Uh, he's gonna fight on the zone. I can't against the guy by the name of against Sebastian Formella. I'm nothing against Connor Ben, Connor Ben, but that's not gonna grab people's attention. So, next week, maybe. Just a show devoted to uh, recapping the fights that's going to take place on the 14th. The uh, Bud Crawford fight will brought the rematch between Franco and Maloney as well as the women's uh, uh, triple header. So, again, light, light show uh, uh, next week. Um, I'm even contemplating taking next week off because there's nothing happening on the 21st. I'll let you guys uh, know. Uh, I'll let you, um, Gail, Daniel, I'll let you know privately. So, yeah, that's what's going to happen on the next episode if there is an episode next week. So, um, yeah, uh, again, boxing on a Friday night, Pound for Pound Box Report on a Friday evening. I know that's rare. My apologies for that. Again, crazy, crazy work schedule for me personally. I've had to push everything back to here on Friday the 13th. So, again, I want to thank everybody who joins on the live YouTube chat. Um, for Gail from Communities Digital News, Daniel from the Inscriber. I'm your host, Michael. This has been episode 306 of Pound for Pound Box Report. Everyone have a good evening. Good night. And, and wear your damn mask. No <laughs> shit. Yeah, yeah 172,000 cases, yeah. Particularly those <laughs> here in the States. COVID cases are rising. Don't be like that stupid uh, 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 Congress move from, from Georgia running around first day entering the walls of Congress and saying how they should, how she shouldn't wear a mask. Don't be that dumb. Peace and hair grease folks. Episode 306 in the books.